Hello everyone, Christopher Beast here, and in today's video we are going to be exploring the evolutionary history of various different Pauls and exactly how their etymology can help us understand where these things came from from an evolutionary perspective. I already had a part one of this series come out a couple of weeks ago that focused on mammalia and all of the different mammals that are in the game and the etymological history of those creatures. But today's video is going to be focusing mainly on some of our more reptilian friends, specifically looking at serpents, dragons, dinosaurs, and birds, which birds aren't exactly reptilian, but if anyone knows any zoology, they are closely related. So that is going to be the focus of today's video, and with no further delay, let's just get right into this. <laughs> Alrighty, so as I said in the intro of this video, we are mainly going to be looking at two different branches of creatures here, and that's going to be those who descended from the universal ancestor of birds and those who descended from the universal ancestor of wizards or reptiles. It should be noted that the reason we're covering these two together is because it is known in zoology that uh, birds, modern day birds, are descendants of some ancient reptile that came during the dinosaurs, that came off of the dinosaurs. They have similar bone structures, similar hand structures. That's a whole thing. For those of you who adore uh, ancient paleontology, you, I'm sure you have an essay waiting for me in my comment section about how I'm grossly oversimplifying this. But for the case of this video, we're going to cover them together because they are the most closely related branches of Paul's as compared to other branches. So looking into, at least starting off of, uh, the reptiles and the wizard types, we can kind of focus in on a tiny group so we can knock them out and then get to some of the other, other, other larger groups. Um, and we can start with the tortoise ancestors. These would be Digtoys and Reptoro. These are very obviously tortoises, very obviously large turtles. Uh, th there's not really a lot to say about either of them and, and what is going on here. They most likely came from a very recent common ancestor of tortoises, but bar that, they're just they're unique little creatures in their own little habitats. Next, we have the serpent category of reptiles. Serpents are known for their you know ability to move around using tough stomach muscles and really just moving around like a worm, uh, shifting left and right, much like a snake does. Um, what this means is that all these serpents must have had at some point in the ancient past an ancient ancestor who was able to grow uh, muscles strong enough through evolution, through random chance, strong enough to actually move around without other limbs. Or they just never developed limbs. Either way it works. Um, one thing looking at this, I just mentioned they don't have limbs, but there is a type of serpent in Paul World that does have limbs, that does kind of break this trend, and that's surfing. Serpent and Serpent Terra both have small little flippers that allow them to move around in their environment. These flippers could suggest either conclusion regarding the ancestry of serpents, uh, either that they had limbs and lost them, or they didn't have limbs and they gained them. Uh, it's simply that it is evolutionary advantage for the serpent to be able to move around with its, using its little flippers in the water, seeing as serpents only live in the water and actually the whole serpent category only lives in the water and serpents are known to be able to have these long bouts of stamina so perhaps these flippers really help it uh, perform these agile movements to keep it competitive in its environment and with serpent terror it's just those flippers are going to be able to help it move through things like sand uh, and keep it competitive in those environments where it's against a lot of other creatures but moving on to the completely whimless serpents we have azarobi and jormantide Azarobi is kind of a simple one. It, it is just a sweet serpent that has, you know, the abilities to harness water, you know, simple Paul world stuff. It, it, it's not really anything to remark about. It's able to do well in its environment because as a serpent, it only has to move around in the water. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of friction to move through. It doesn't have to do a lot of uh, real constriction or strong body movements. And then Jormantide. Jormantide is just a very fast, sweet uh, serpent. It most likely benefits from being a serpent due to uh, being such a sweet body shape. It can move very quickly. And I think that that does add up with what we know about Jormantide. So from here, we can kind of move to uh, from the serpents to a, a little bit like a humanoid wizard or the bipedal wizard. Uh, and this is where you would get Wolviander and Wespunk. Wolviander and Wespunk share a very recent ancestor, at least I believe so. 
Uh, and that's partially because as wizards, they're not only the only two bipedals, but they also do interact with humanity in unique ways, with Wespunk kind of emulating the human uh, culture and Loviander, you know, interacting with humans in a, in a different way. Why these two uh, evolved to be bipedal and is up for debate. I put them as their own separate category and together because of the aforementioned, they're the only two bipeds, they have similar body shapes, and their relationship with humans are very similar. Um, but I do want to note with Loviander regarding their natural habitat, they are found mostly in sand dunes, which are very hot. If they are a lizard, they cannot regulate their body temperature properly. And in the real world, that's not really an issue. Um, there's that's That would be a whole snake scientist type of thing to sit down and explain. But what Loviander may be doing to avoid overheating their body, um, as opposed to other lizards, which may be okay with having a hotter body um, due to being cold, uh, they may be standing up to try and avoid that higher level of heat coming off of the sands. And if that is the case, that would actually suggest that Loviander and Wespunk are very genetically different than a lot of other wizards, uh, simply because wizards tend to like it hot. But that's just some speculation. I'm not entirely sure. What we can do to get us a little bit more certainty, though, is move on to the next category of serpents dash wizards dash reptiles, and that is dinosaurs. Everybody loves dinosaurs. I remember being a little kid and loving dinosaurs. So with dinosaurs, we kind of have uh, like a straight line and then branches off of that straight line. Uh, so the first major branch of dinosaurs is your quadruped dinosaurs. This is every other dinosaur is not a quadruped. There's one dinosaur that is quadruped, and that is a brown cherry. Brown cherry is most likely quadruped due to its unique relationship with photosynthesis and being atropic. Uh, if you are a creature that is in real in the real world, there's not. I don't think there's anything like this. And if there is something like this, I just haven't heard about it. But there are not many animals that photosynthesize um, simply because it's it's not entirely something they do. But what bronze cherry may be doing is um, absorbing extra energy that it's unable to acquire elsewhere through eating um, in through photosynthesis or through a symbiotic relationship with plants. Either way, that does create a evolutionary pressure for it to be able to stand kind of firm and kind of stand tall. And that evolutionary pressure uh, encourages being a quadruped because quadrupeds are more stable. They're not going to fall over in the wind. They're not going to none of that. So it kind of encourages a more quadrupedal design. And that's why I think we do see brown cherry being the lone dinosaur that is quadrupedal, uh, just because of that symbiotic relationship it would have uh, being an autotrophic photosynthesis. Next, we have bipedal dinosaurs. Bipedals are the majority of dinosaurs. There are three dinosaurs that are bipedal. Um, two of those dinosaurs are flightless. And I'm going to get into that when we get to the flightless one, but one is not, and that's Ipodron. Ipodron is able to fly. It does have nice wings. It, it's it's able to do that. And that makes Ipodron separate. That means it must have broken off from these other two dinosaurs at a earlier point. But the two flightless dinosaurs we have are Dinosaurum and Relaxosaurus. I believe these two dinosaurs are flightless, not exactly because it was evolutionarily advantaged, but because of their unique interactions with um, some of the other species that we see. Dinosaurum is a very powerful dinosaur. Like it, it is one of, it is not exactly an apex predator. I'm not entirely sure if it is a predator at all, but it is something that is like strong and powerful. There are not a lot of things besides other dinosaurs, wyverns, and dragons that can actually take on a dinosaur in their natural environment, especially because they, they tend to group up. Due to this fact, there's no need for it to kind of travel long distances for food, and there's no reason for it to kind of compete for food. It can kind of just settle down and be fine. And I think that's what we see with dinosaur, especially because it has it also has a unique relationship with photosynthesis. Um, I think we see dinosaur kind of being a a more sedimentary creature because it's gotten so large because of the plentiful amounts of food in the area that it doesn't have to fly. And, and honestly, flying would cost too much energy. It would no longer be worth it because of how large the creature's gotten. Same is trying to, tr especially true. And I think this this conclusion is extremely hammer true by Roaxosaurus. Roaxosaurus is known for being a vocarious eater that likes sleeping all day. This is a creature that is evidently showing a heightened metabolic, metabolic level due to its size. 
it most likely, again, going to Dinosom, if you look at Dinosom, Dinosom's kind of adapted to this situation by getting photosynthesis. Relaxosaurus has not. Relaxosaurus's entire gist of, of needing ravenous amounts of calories in order to sustain itself is most likely because it's gotten way too large. And we're talking about wizards here. That's a lot of temperature regulation that wizards are not notoriously good at. So it has to be large to uh, kind of <laughs> be able to, it has to be able to consume vast amounts of calories, which is what's making it so large is that it's consuming all those calories, but it has to be large to regulate its temperature uh, due to the environment. But at the same time, this kind of creates like a horrible metabolic cycle where things like flying, which would be extremely metabolic, lots of lots of energy would have to be put out for flying, just isn't intelligent. Uh, it isn't going to do it any favors. And I feel like evolutionary pressures are taking away its ability to fly because it's gotten so large and it's gotten such a strange dynamic. Why that dynamic developed, I don't know. It could be a, perhaps Paul World did not have a mass extinction event like we did. And, and as of such, that's why we see the draconics and the dragons the way they, uh, the dinosaurs the way they are. I don't entirely know. That would be a question for someone else who has spent hours looking at this. I don't know if anyone else fits that T. But moving on from dragons, we can get to the Draconics. With the Draconics, we've got uh, lots of different categories. We've got like wyverns, weirms, pure dragons, and semi-Draconics. For the pure Draconics, which is going to be your weirms, wyverns, pure dragons, these are defined based off of the general terms that I believe are used for weirms, wyverns, and, and the pure dragons. I separated them because I think they take obvious inspiration from these fantasy tropes. I think the separations would be apparent. So I'm just going to listen to the source material here. On the wyverns, we have quyvern, um, adorable thing, but yeah. On the weirms, we have von weirm. On the pure dragons, we have the regular dragon, which is Arlcirk. But on the biomechanical side, we have Astagon and Jet Dragon. So to build on this note, the rest of the dragons, not a lot's going on here. Um, when we look at Quivern, Venwirn, and Ulcerc, you kind of just see uh, dragons that have been just kind of normalized into the world of Paul World. It's very unique because usually dragons, when you see them in games, are like very dominant. You know, Skyrim uh, to a degree, Elden Ring, where you have these very dominant dragons that definitely disturb the environments they're in. That's not the case in Paul World. <laughs> the dragons are just kind of there. Uh, maybe Quivern could be argued that it's a, a disturbance to its environment, but everything else kind of no. I don't really think they could be classified as that. And that's where the biomechanical dragons really interest me. Is the biomechanical dragons? I mean, I mean, Paul World has a lot of Pauls that are very clearly influenced by the effects of humanity. I mean, I would say that's one of the very unique things that Paul World does to differentiate itself from other. Um, monster collectors. The dynamic that Pauls have with humanity is definitely explored in things like Jet Dragon, where Jet Dragon is not an evolutionary great idea. Uh, as we can see from the other Draconics, they're not doing too great in their environments. They're not too disturbing. They're not too dominant either. I would say things like Grisbolt are definitely doing better in their natural environment or the Panda line. Um, and due to that, you see humanity kind of interfering with these majestic beasts of the dragons and actually making them very viable. I mean, Jet Dragon is a very viable dragon. Uh, Astagon is a very, very viable dragon. And I think that's what we kind of see in that regard. And then finally, to finish off the Draconics, we have Blazemut. Blazemut's here in the Draconics because it, it has a beak. It has a general scaly skin. I think it's based off of a Chimera, personally, which good luck putting the etymology of a Chimera on there. I, I think it's more so just, again, humanity doing humanity things but this video is already 14 minutes long and we've just gotten to the birds thank you for sitting along if you have so far so bird time bird time we have a lot of birds um first we should kind of look at the weird bird there is a singular bird in the game that is just odd and it kind of feels like a midway point between the uh, reptilians and the birds proper and that's suzaku or suzaku however you pronounce it i don't know what this thing is it looks like a bird but not really. It kind of looks like something straight out of your nightmares. I don't know how to classify that etymologically. Uh, if anyone has any ideas, uh, let me know. I don't think in our world, nightmares evolve. Um, but with our birds, we have two categories. We have land-dwelling birds. These would be your happy birds that cannot fly. And then you have proper birds, birds that can properly fly. 
land dwelling birds are mostly aquatic. And that makes sense. If you look at the real world, we have like penguins. Penguins are your happy little aquatic bird. They're not flying a lot. And with those, you have Thwack, who's just kind of a duck that can't fly. I don't know why a duck would evolve the ability to not be able to fly. I don't think that's evolutionarily beneficial to it. I could be wrong, but I don't know. Uh, and then penguin ancestors, you have like Penguillet and Penguin that are very clearly etymologically related. Again, the, the game might go like, oh, these are not the same species. Yes, but they definitely have some ancient, ancient ancestor. Um, it might be co convergent evolution, but there is a lot of odd things about them that would be like, that's some odd convergent evolution. Like I've never heard of two species evolving to have the same, like, everything like there's one thing to say that this moth evolved to look like a bee it's a completely different thing to say the the moth evolved a stinger a hive mentality and the ability to collect uh, pollen the exact same way as a bee that's that's a little crazy i don't entirely think it works that way but so at least in my mind the aquatic birds are generally speaking uh those you would also have your non-aquatic birds, this being chickpea, which is a chicken. We don't really need to think about how that evolved because we have the real world chicken to think about. And then Hucrates, who I don't have a clue how that evolved. Um, I don't see any evolutionary benefits in that at all. But yeah, so we get to our proper birds. Uh, there is one odd proper bird, and that's Cognito. And I think it's odd specifically because of its lore page, where it specifically says like, yo, it used to be in the skies, now it's not. I have no idea what's going on with this one. This one's just like an odd one out. But birds of prey. Birds of prey, we can get a little simpler. Uh, there are different types of birds of prey. For example, we can look at like gale claw. That's one thing. We can look at falcons, which would be nightwing and uh, phalaris. We can look at fire hawks, which would be hesifil and ragnahawk. And then we can look at the greater hawks category as a whole, which would be bee gone. Generally speaking, when we're talking about birds of prey and these, and these giant birds, there's not a lot to talk about etymologically because I'm not a bird expert. And even if I was, I don't think you'd want to sit here and listen to the etymology of birds for 40 minutes. But genetic mutations do need to be brought up. I mean, we've been talking about humanity's roles with pals, definitely an important feature of Paul world. And that's where we get shadow beak, which is a Paul that was genetically moderate, like influenced by, there was a bird, then it got influenced by humanity. And uh, that's how we get shadow. So that is everything for this video. Uh, 17 minutes is kind of crazy. I didn't expect it to be that long. But I've been exploring the uh, etymological and evolutionary record of Paul's. And I figured, you know, it'd be pretty cool if I was able to uh, bring my findings to you all. This series will continue. We have two more videos planned up the pipeline. Uh, Hopefully you will find those interesting. If you'd like to talk more about Paul World's etymology, zoology, evolution, or just Paul World in general or modding, there is a Discord link in the description called VSL that I think you'd like. And uh, if you're interested in content like this, odd content that no one could have perceived or predicted occurring, you feel free to subscribe or leave a comment about something you'd like me to cover. This has been Christopher Beast, and I hope to see you all next time.